I wish to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. I wish to acknowledge and res um, respect their continuing culture and the contribution they make to the life in this city and the region. I also acknowledge and welcome the Aboriginal people attending here this evening. It is vital with the topic of our seminar tonight that we highlight the impact of colonisation and westernisation on the Aboriginal communities and the resultant intergenerational trauma. Aboriginal children have specific vulnerabilities that must be considered as we talk about the trauma-informed practice that we are aiming to achieve. And this is at the forefront of our minds as we work towards creating healthy and supportive environments for children. I called this seminar the Tough Love Debate to highlight the need to have a conversation about community love for our young generation. I think strong love is a much better concept in which we define and support behavioural boundaries but unconditionally and strongly love our children. It can be a tough conversation to be had as there are opposing views as to how best to support positive behaviours and the mental health of children and adolescents. Young lives matter and it's time for us to stop, commit to the, stop us from the cycle of getting tough and being soft and to start just using evidence. We have plenty of evidence about how best to support young people and we need to draw more on this extensive knowledge. My role as an academic is to bring this evidence to practitioners, to each and every one of you. Um, and I know that you're often far too busy to read journal articles. This bringing of evidence is what underpins the Thoughtful Schools project, which I will summarise for you after Howard speaks. But first, um, it's my immense pleasure to thank the UWA Public Policy Institute for their support and organisation of this evening's seminar. I'd like to welcome the Institute's Director, Professor Shamit Shagar, who will outline the role of the Institute. I'm the director of the UWA Public Policy Institute, and I've been in post from the early part of this year. Uh, why a public policy institute? Well, because UWA, in common with uh, major research-intensive universities all over the world, are conscious that whatever expertise and insights they have, it's important that that is shared with a wider public and with government and with practitioners. Uh, we said in our own strategy for 2025 that we want to become more civic minded as a university. In other words, we want to be of service to our state uh, and our city. Uh, and having a public policy institute whose job it is to get behind the evidence and expertise and make sure that it's used more generally is a good example of doing precisely that. So I'm delighted this evening that we uh, can be the sponsors of this evening's event. Uh, very quickly, what do we do in the Public Policy Institute that justifies that very large claim? Three things. Uh, we translate, we focus on timing, and we are uh, aware and sensitive about trust. Translation means that whether we like it or not, uh, policymakers, practitioners, and all research users tend to think and operate in terms of short paragraphs and a couple of pages. They don't necessarily operate on the basis of learned journal papers, uh, and that is something that uh, we in the academy have to just recognise. So translation and avoiding jargon and gobbledygook is the very least we can do if we want to be of service to the wider community. Timing is important because a lot of our research that we do operates on its own cycle and doesn't necessarily correspond to the ways in which policy is formulated, developed and then implemented, so we can do more to make sure instead of being perfectly right all of the time and missing the policy window, that we are largely well informed and we go through that opportunity with the policy window. And lastly, trust, like most things in life, it's important that policymakers in government, in commerce, in non-profits, in campaign organisations, all these different sectors, it's important that they have a relationship with us. Relationships do work on the basis of knowing trusted parties within universities uh, and we can do something about that in the Public Policy Institute. So we're delighted to be part of an event uh, that Karen Martin has been uh, instrumental in organising in terms of the thoughts, the content and now this evening's uh, record sort of uh, attendance. Uh, I'm very aware of the fact that this is a very big response uh, and how schools can support 
issues of mental health and with kids and how they can indeed support better outcomes for all kids. It seems to me it's a very laudable objective that we're delighted to be part of. Um, why schools? Well, I can think of two sets of reasons why this would be core business for a public policy institute at any major university. The first is, as we've been doing for some time, we've been having a number of policy events here and elsewhere on issues to do with attainment, WA's own schools policy, the future of work, and in the new year we'll be looking at uh, the My School website and the extent to which it's made transparency uh, more effective. And indeed, we'll be also be looking at ATAR as another mechanism by which universities recruit to their ranks. But more generally, apart from what we've done and what we're proposing, I can think of no better example of a complex public policy challenge that a policy, public policy institute would want to take on. Well, there's many things going on. One, there's complexity. We've got speakers this evening whose job it is to help to demystify some of that. Secondly, there are many, many moving parts. Uh, all of us who have children, of course, are absolute experts on our kid, which in some way gives us license to be experts on kids, the plural. Strange, but that's the way in which life seems to work. And per force, the issues of what goes on in schools for those who are doing well and those who are not doing well touches all of us on a daily basis when we think about our children, or we think about our friends' children and our family's children. And lastly, and most importantly, the way in which Karen was outlining, I can think of no better example of robust evidence, which is our core business, being used to inform public policy. The alternative of having that would be public policy that is based on preferences and prejudices. And those, it seems to me, need to at least be balanced by what we know systematically through robust research. So I'm delighted that all those things are true, and I'm delighted that you can be part of us this evening. Uh, I won't keep you very much longer. We've got very much, uh, a lot of things to get through. But my last duty is to introduce our first keynote, and that is Dr. Howard Bath, who is, um, let me just read out his biography, if I can very briefly. He's been involved in uh, the provision of child, youth, and family services for over, over 40 years. He originally trained as a clinical psychologist, and he's worked as a youth worker, a manager, and as a CEO of a child and family services agency. Between 08 and 15, Howard was the inaugural Children's Commissioner of Australia's Northern Territory. In 2010, he co-chaired a major government inquiry into the child protection services of Nor the Northern Territory. He's widely published in areas of family preservation, out-of-home care, child protection, development trauma, and with his co-author John Sieta, recently he's published a book entitled The Three Pillars of Transforming Care. It's my entire pleasure to welcome you to address the audience. So thank you very much, Shamit, and thank you, Karen, for the invitation. What a treat to see such a big group of people interested in the topic of discipline and responding to kids with challenging behaviours. There are lots of theories of behaviour. Um, I was just thinking of this as I was writing it down, especially perplexing and challenging behaviours. Um, moral choices, uh, so-called bad parenting, uh, genetics, uh, sometimes referred to as bad blood, epigenetics, reinforcement rewards, developmental disorders, certain illnesses, habits, thinking errors, substances like alcohol and other drugs, uh, certain foods, uh, even food colouring, um, modelling, and, and I could go on. I've even heard uh, parents and teachers ascribe certain behaviours to the phases of the moon um, and even the wind. You heard that one? Um, each of these uh, putative causes of bad behaviour represents a theory of behaviour, um, often an implicit theory, uh, because it's not formally articulated, but it's held strongly nevertheless. And each theory suggests implicitly, what we could do and should do to deal with a behaviour. One common theory uh, about young people with aggressive behaviours uh, is that they lack a moral conscience or a sense of social responsibility. Uh, they therefore need to experience shame. Uh, the theory suggests that the deeply aversive feeling of being shamed uh, will have a salutary effect on their behaviour, lead them to more pro-social behaviours, uh, safer communities and acceptance, reacceptance into the community. Have you heard of that theory? Uh, this has led to public policy in certain jurisdictions, 
Uh, now, let's hope this is, yep, there we go. And this is from the Northern Territory where I spent some time. And this is the, the theory in action, what we should be doing to trouble kids uh, who fail to behave in the way that we expect. Um, I, I have to say that actually this theory, this government didn't get in at this particular time, um, but the t-shirts did. You could buy them down the local markets and the kids were wearing them uh, as a bit of a joke. <laughs> so, uh, the research now strongly suggests that we should be more alert than we've been in the, in the past to the profound role of traumatic experiences in childhood. Uh, more alert than we've been in the past, because we've always known this. It's not as if this is new. Uh, what's new is the research about it and how we can quantify the impact of those traumatic experiences. So I'm just going to review really quickly um, uh, Felitti and Anders' work, which I think is uh, perhaps the most influential work on child development, research on child development in the last couple of decades. And just really quickly, their research is generally called the adverse childhood experiences study. There's about 60 published papers coming out of that study and many, many replications uh, all around the world. Um, they found, for instance, that there were 10 relatively common adverse experiences uh, in a middle class sample in the US. Large sample, about 17,000 people. Uh, I say middle class sample because there are, of course, many more adverse experiences than just the 10 that they talk about. Uh, but they found, what they found has changed the face of child development and our understanding of what we need to be doing. Uh, uh, for example, they found that these were the 10 uh, key or most common adverse experiences that children, uh, middle class children experience. I won't go through them in detail, but when it says mental illness, it means mental illness of a parent or domestic, uh, kid wit witnessing uh, domestic violence in the family or a parent or older sibling uh, involved in criminal behaviour, for example. The bottom ones have to do with formally adjudicated uh, abuse or neglect. And um, their research actually was very, very simple. Uh, it suggested that the sheer number of different adverse experiences uh, it doesn't matter how often they happened, uh, as long as they were different, uh, had a very strong correlation with a whole range of uh, medical, life-threatening conditions, poor social outcomes in adolescence and ad ad adulthood. In fact, there was often a linear relationship with the sheer number of adverse childhood experiences and adverse outcomes for those children later. Here's just one example. Um, this is lifetime alcoholism. So someone at some point in their life had a problem with alcoholism that needed to be treated in a medical, uh, in a medical facility. And so we see here that someone who had zero of those 10 ACEs, and about a third of the sample had zero, has about a 3%, just over 2% chance of becoming alcoholic at some point in their life. Um, just one. Just one of those adverse childhood experiences, see what happens. The risk increases threefold, just from one of those adverse childhood experiences. Uh, see what happens with four or more. The risk increases eightfold. Um, now, of course, this is, this is a correlation. It's not necessarily saying it's a direct causal relationship. However, it's a very strong relationship. Here's illicit drug use. Now, we're getting closer, aren't we, to the, the sort of issues that our young people are involved in. But let's have a look at this. About 6% of this population with zero childhood uh, adversities, uh, about 6% report illicit drug use. Uh, let's see what happens as they add ACEs. One, two, three, four. And at four or more ACEs, we've got a percentage now that's starting to look at a very significant proportion of that population. Over a quarter of people with four ACEs report involvement in illicit drug use. They go on to suggest that if we, if we look at a lot of out, uh, adverse outcomes, we can calculate the impact of childhood trauma, the contribution of trauma to the incidence of those outcomes. For instance, if we could if we could eliminate childhood trauma, we would see a halving of illicit drug use. We'd see a nearly 80% reduction in IV drug use. We'd see a halving of current depression in our community, uh, a two-thirds reduction in alcoholism, a uh, two-thirds reduction in suicide attempts. And Felidi and Ander said that these findings provide a credible basis for a new paradigm 
of medical, public health, and social service practice, a new way of thinking about it. So we've moved on from curses, uh, from miasmas, uh, in thinking about disease. Uh, we've even moved on from germ theory <laughs> to a large extent. We're, what we're finding is that a very significant amount uh, of, of the, the causes uh, have to do with external traumatic agents. Okay, now we know that those who come in contact with child protection, youth justice, special education services, these young people have childhoods scarred by trauma. Bruce Perry uses the evocative phrase, these children are marinated in fear. In fact, it's rare for any of us to have children with less than four aces, um, and many of us work with children with 10 of them. Um, I often ask uh, my audiences, well, how many aces do you think is the average number of aces you work with, with kids? And eight or more is very, very common. Compared to those who have zero aces in their lives, someone with just four or more aces, just four, has a seven times, is, is seven times more likely to become alcoholic at some point in their life. They're 10 times more likely to be an IV drug user. And they're 12 times more likely to have attempted suicide. And yes, there's a very, very strong relationship between the number and type of ACEs and a whole range of behavior problems with children and adolescents, such as alcohol, drug use, and aggression. In other words, what has happened to them is a significant determinant of those behaviors. Sandra Bloom is well known for reminding us that the research on trauma has, the way, has changed the questions we need to ask. She says, the, tr the question has fundamentally changed from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. Do we really want to punish young people for what has happened to them? So what is this new paradigm, this new way of understanding? Uh, I want to just tell a little story that came to mind as I was thinking about this. It's one of the many episodes of, of a life spent working in child welfare, youth justice, uh, mental health, and special education. But also as a parent of three girls. It's not a particularly dramatic episode, but it came to mind as I was thinking about this issue of punishment. So I was working in a residential treatment program uh, as a young youth worker. Uh, Maria came in. Uh, she was 14. Uh, she had recently arrived. She, 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 he was shy. She, she had long black hair and she had the hair uh, uh, over her face a lot of the time. Uh, she was only, the only child of a single mother who had battled depression and alcohol abuse. And she'd been placed into care because of a chronic pattern of uh, uh, neglect at home and what we used to call moral danger, being in moral danger, um, abuse by various partners um, uh, of the mum and hers, a habit of wandering around the streets at night. And so eventually uh, she was placed in the residential centre. So one evening uh, I was on duty with another care worker and uh, Maria had been doing quite well and we had allowed her to go into town with a buddy to go on a shopping trip. Uh, so she was given good reminder about how to behave when she was in town. Uh, you know, the parent speech before the kids go out. The expected behavior, time of return, you know, keep away from people, don't be talking to people you don't know, all that sort of thing. Um, and my youth worker colleague and I settled in for dinner and uh, looking after the other kids. So it was a, we were looking after about 10 at that stage. Uh, Maria's buddy arrived back on time without Maria. Uh, and she told us that Maria had gone off by herself. Uh, we were worried, we were anxious, and we started to think about mounting a search for her. And just as we were about to go out, there was a noise at the front door, and Maria was there, totally drunk, hardly able to stand up. Uh, she staggered in, spewed on the floor, uh, and then curled up in a chair in a, in a ball, in a uh, uh, sofa, in, on a ball. So the question is, what should we have done? in response to Maria's disobedience uh, that evening, especially after we had given her the parent talk. So annoyed that she had broken the rules, that she had proven to be untrustworthy, and perhaps a little worried about what might have happened to her, 
um, I started to lecture her on expected behaviour. Didn't we just tell you about what the expectations were? Um, and then I had a great answer for her behaviour because we used a behavioural system in those days. We had a point system and a level system. If the kids behaved, they got a certain number of points. If, if they misbehaved, they lost a certain number of points. And at the end of the week, we would tally it up. And of course, this is all very scientific at the time. And, um, and uh, so Maria would now lose 100 points and she would drop a level of privilege. Now, I was still studying psychology while I was working. Uh, working to get the money to study psychology, actually. Um, and behavioural theory was all the rage at that, at that time. Um, we nudged, uh, all those unscientific uh, theories, uh, analytic theories, have been nudged aside. And we were assured that behavioural theory was the scientific way of thinking about behaviour. Uh, it was all about rewards, punishments, uh, reward schedules, behavioural extinction, and, and so on. Uh, it was being tempered a little bit by learning theory and some cognitive approaches were getting a hearing. And we cared about the kids. Uh, but, you know, like most other places those days, we used this quasi-behavioural uh, system. Uh, we understood that we were there to teach children how they should behave uh, and, and to prepare them for the real world. Uh, the earning and loss of points were the tools for keeping order and for teaching the lessons of life. Does anyone remember those days? Um, so getting back to the research, we know that the impacts of early developmental trauma work themselves or insinuate themselves into many developmental processes uh, so that physical, social and other forms of functioning are affected. This is what the extensive research suggests to us. And just, I'm just rolling through this quickly here. It affects attachment, the child's ability to feel comfortable with someone else and to attach to them. Uh, it affects social skills. Uh, these kids struggle with reading the sig signals, the social signals from others and knowing how they should respond. Uh, it affects their biological systems. We know that from Felitti's work. Uh, we know that if they have six or more ACEs, which I've got to tell you is most of those kids in child protection and in youth justice and in special schools, they will live on average two decades less than someone with zero ACEs in their lives. Uh, we know that it affects the regulation, the ability to regulate feelings and impulses. We know that often these kids will dissociate as a way of coping. Excuse me. They have difficulties generally with behavioural control. Uh, many of them have difficulties with cognitive functioning, uh, especially in school, and they struggle with problems uh, around poor self-concept, shame and guilt. One of these is consistently, uh, 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 it, it's consistently been pointed out that one of these is the most significant impact of trauma. Uh, how can I say, some people call it the core impact of trauma. One of those. I wonder which one you think that might be. Now it's not a test. Uh, and of course there's individual differences. But actually the research and the clinical opinion uh, uh, it, it, it is, is congruent on, on this particular point. Um, so, I'll just get into it then. Future orientation by ability to, to, to uh, conceptualise a positive future. Alan Shaw tells us this, the most significant consequence of early relational trauma is the child's failure to develop the capacity to self-regulate the intensity and the duration of emotional states. Um, here's Bessel van der Kolk, one of the doyens of the research in this field. Uh, he tells us that the core of traumatic stress is a breakdown in the capacity to regulate internal states. I could go on uh, and quote many others, but I think you get the point. A little bit of frustration uh, explodes into rage. A little bit of anxiety morphs into an overwhelming terror or panic. A disappointment sinks into desolation. A fragile sense of self-worth grows into an enveloping sense of shame. Uh, feelings of loss, despair, shame threaten to overwhelm and moods swing from high to low without being able to reach a satisfactorily equilibrium. They are stuck in what Porges, Stephen Porges calls a state of defensive arousal, perpetually prepared to fight or flee, uh, not to relax and engage. And these are the kids we're talking about in the school. Of course, that's one of the reasons they struggle at school. Here's Bruce Perry, again, one of the doyens of the research. Traumatised children, he tells us, 
uh, reset their normal level of arousal. Even where no external threats exist, they're in a persistent state of alarm. Some young people who have been exposed to severe threat early in life have learned to close down and under-respond to threat. They don't all over-respond, some of them under-respond. They manage a dangerous world through avoidance and withdrawal. In fact, there's some stunning new research about this, uh, this subgroup of kids who seem to under-respond to potential threat. Still others oscillate between hypervigilance and emotional withdrawal unable to find a satisfactory response to the sense of feeling threatened. And trauma is not the only reason for this sort of instability, but it's an important cause. Um, and it's not just anger. Uh, these people, young people struggle with its fear, its grief, its loss, its loneliness, its shame, and many other troubling emotions. Uh, Louis Cozzolino, one of the uh, uh, more graphic uh, writers in this field, says the traumatized young person is drowning in a sea of fragmented and overwhelming emotions, sensations and frightening thoughts. James Angland is one of the prominent researchers in the field of out-of-home care, uh, where many of the young people in uh, child protection end up, uh, from Canada. He spent a lot of time in his research just listening to kids in care. With no particular agenda, he would talk with them if they talked with him. But just, what are they going to talk about? What are these kids going to talk about? He found that there was one prominent theme that came out from his discussions with kids in 10 different centres, and that was the theme of emotional pain. They didn't use the word, words grief, loss, and so on. They often referred to it just as pain. Here's uh, Bruce Perry, who many of you would have heard of. He's, he tells us this, that troubled children are in some sort of pain, and pain makes people irritable, anxious, and aggressive. Anglin clearly saw that the challenging behaviours he witnessed in those 10 centres were often rooted in emotional pain. And he coined the term pain-based behaviour. Not all bad behaviours are pain-based behaviours. I want to say that. I don't believe that all of them are. Uh, but many are. Um, uh, you might be aware of that research, by the way, that shows that the brain circuits involved in physical pain overlap considerably with the brain circuits involved in social and emotional pain. In fact, there's even some research suggesting that analgesics work pretty well when you're feeling social pain, at least for a short period of time. Um, and it's no wonder then, isn't it, that we use the pain metaphor when we're talking about emotional distress. So despite the prominent theme of emotional pain, Anglin was intrigued that many of the workers who came there as caring people and were still caring people failed to see the emotional pain, could only see the irritating behaviours. Um, and he said this, um, seldom did the care workers acknowledge or respond sensitively to the inner world of the child. Uh, instead, he said, they would react with controlling demands and warn of possible consequences. You know the sort of things, don't you talk to me like that. If you keep talking like this, you know what the outcome is going to be, without making an attempt to understand what was driving that sort of behaviour. This led Anglin to propose what he thought was the central challenge for anyone who's looking after traumatised kids. I wonder what you think the central challenge is. He says it's this, it's dealing with primary pain without unnecessarily inflicting secondary pain through punitive or controlling reactions. Interesting, isn't it? I'd like to return to Maria for a moment. I wasn't going to let that one go. Well, you wouldn't be surprised. What do you think happened to Maria after I began to lecture her and impose the consequence? Well, uh, you wouldn't be surprised she didn't confess her misdeeds or show contrition. But she threw up, which was annoying, and she started to sob. Deep, heaving sobs, and it just went on and on. And being a young male youth worker, I didn't know what to do. She seemed to be overwhelmed with sadness and emotional pain. And eventually she stammered, 
I've never had a birthday party. So that was a bit perplexing. And then I remember that earlier that day, just after school, we had, we had held a, a small birthday celebration for one of the boys. A cake, some nuts, chips, lollies, etc. Just a little event. It was an event of recognition for the boy, but a reminder to Maria of everything she hadn't had. It also spoke, of course, to her sense of significance and self-worth. And it was hard for me as a behaviorist not to get caught up in her distress. Suddenly, the threatening of points seemed pointless. I didn't mean it, just came out that way. <laughs> I stammered something like, we'd make sure we had a party for her next time. And then later on, I worried that perhaps my soft response uh, would have reinforced her avoidant alcohol abusing behaviours. So how has the trauma framework changed the way we think about and understand young people like Maria? Because there's many Marias in our schools uh, and in our youth centres. Well for a start I think it suggests this, that Maria's problem behaviours were likely to be related to her turbulent inner life, one that she was struggling to manage and not simply the result of bad choices, problem thinking, uh, bad modelling, that sort of thing. Like many teenagers, she didn't know how to communicate her thoughts and feelings. Many adults can't either. She couldn't do that in a healthy and adaptive way and we weren't primed to be aware of them. She lacked the confidence that we would respond to, with sympathy and understanding so she went off to try and solve her problems by herself. And she used alcohol, a coping strategy probably she'd seen at home many times. And on the issue of shame mentioned earlier, shame was surely prominent amongst those tur turbulent emotions that we saw that night. A deep sense of not being good enough, not belonging, uh, being socially deficient in some way or defective. Dan Hughes puts it this way, Kids in the out-of-home care system are enveloped in shame. Isn't it incredible that there are still voices calling for shame-based interventions with these kids? For kids that are enveloped in shame. They used to be popular, I know I used to work in this area, with property crimes and sex offenders. And they've been virtually abandoned in every place because the research shows they don't work, and they don't work at all, and sometimes they increase the risk of reoffending. Another thing the encounter with Maria taught me is that consequences and lectures almost never work uh, in changing behaviour when that behaviour is rooted in emotional pain. That's just pain for pain. I didn't think so at the time, but I wasn't in the right mindset to think about it. Bessel van der Kolk, the prominent trauma specialist, has given us this salutary warning. He says, faced with challenging behaviours, caregivers deal with their frustration by retaliating in ways that often uncannily repeat the children's early trauma. And this is one of the biggest risks in the get tough policies. How many times have we seen this play out? Um, I've been quite involved with youth justice, youth justice issues for some years, including uh, with the events uh, leading up to the Don Dale Royal Commission. One young lad in, in particular comes to mind. He had a childhood history of early and sustained physical and sexual abuse and neglect. There were all sorts of people coming and going through his house. There was a lot of drug use and partner violence. His ace count was through the roof. He started masking his emotional pain with solvents when he was just eight years old. He told me that his greatest fears were of being physically attacked and beaten up and being abandoned. And this had happened to him repeatedly through his life. So now he's in a youth justice setting in detention. You wouldn't be surprised, well I asked this question, what do you think happened to him whenever his emotions got the better of him in detention? You wouldn't be surprised, the first thing he did was brace to fight. 
Then he got surrounded, physically taken down by multiple staff members, and then placed in an isolated, uh, sorry, in an isolation cell for extended periods. If you've read that Royal Commission, you know extended periods means weeks, and in some cases, months. And so the cycle was repeated. His childhood trauma was reenacted again and again in that particular setting. Whatever our outlook on discipline may be, and I'm just about getting there, Karen. <laughs> Whatever our outlook on discipline may be, the reality is that young men like this will soon be back out on our streets. I don't know what the average time is in detention, but it's a matter of months, it's not years. Do we really want them to be out here with us, hopeless, embittered, and seeking revenge against the community that rewarded their pain with more pain? Because that's the reality with these kids. Now, I'm not blind to the fact that some young people can be very violent. I've experienced some of it. And they can be difficult to manage. And I accept that a small number at times do present a real risk to peers and to adults. Some may have to be physically contained for a period of time. And I also stress that not all behaviours are pain-based behaviours. Some are the result of bad modelling. Some are the result, of learned, so, uh, result from learned, deliberate and instrumental behaviours to try and achieve a goal. It's not necessarily related to an emotional driver. And that tells us that we'll always need really good assessment processes and good legal processes so we can try and tease out what really is going on with each individual kid. However, force, consequences or exclusion should only be used when we've done what we can to meet both their developmental needs and to humanely manage their unruly behaviours. When containment and exclusion are used, it's a sign of our collective failure to come up with a better solution for the kids. I think we should be very concerned when suspensions and expulsions are touted as victories, when they're, touted, when they're put forward as KPIs of success, which seems to be the case in some reports that I've seen. Surely our primary focus must be on healing and reclaiming these kids and not wounding and excluding them. Just a quick footnote, and I'm, I'm getting over time here, uh, on Maria. Uh, what did she need from us? Well, um, I could go on about that. Uh, I suspect, looking back, it was a, what she needed was a genuine attempt from us to understand what her inner struggles were. Uh, a sense that we cared about her as people, not that, we, not that she was just the object of our uh, behaviour management strategies. Uh, a sense that she was physically but also emotionally safe, that she could express herself in our centre, didn't need to go out and hide her emotions and drown them in alcohol. And or, or, uh, most of all, of course, a sense of hope that there was a positive future for her. So I, I ran into uh, Maria a few years later. She got uh, transferred out. You know how these things happen, child welfare, or someone moves her on. And I lost touch with her. And uh, uh, a few years later, just, just by chance, I happened to run into her again in a cafe. And uh, uh, she greeted me warmly, thankfully. Uh, uh, she, I don't think she could even remember uh, the details of that incident. And we talked for a while, we talked about friends and uh, good times. And I, I reflected after that that um, sometimes kids can look through the mistakes that we made as long as they get a sense that we did care and were able to connect with them. And in, in child welfare, we're about the only field of practice in this world that thinks good enough is enough or good enough. And we talk about the good enough parent in child welfare. And I often think of myself as the, I, I must have been a, a good enough youth worker uh, for Maria. So I'd like to leave you tonight uh, with this 
uh, a closing thought from the uh, philosopher and mathematician Jacob Bronowski. Uh, and I think he captures uh, some of what, what my thinking is uh, uh, in terms of working with these kids that really do challenge us. He says, mankind masters nature, not by force, but by understanding. Thank you. I just pay my respects to the Wajak Noongar people um, and their elders past and present and emerging. And didn't they do a wonderful job? Didn't their ancestors do a wonderful job of looking after this beautiful country? And don't we have a magnificent place here, right on the river, the Durba Yurigan, and this lovely facility that we have today. So we really honour them for providing us with this opportunity. Uh, okay, this is a big, big topic. Um, I, I've been a clinician for a long time, so I've worked with very traumatised families and children and communities and schools, in fact, uh, for a long time, some 30-odd some years in, in clinical practice. And sometimes I've had you know, really fantastic experiences where we've been able to get things turned around and we've seen the child thrive. And other times it's been a really tough gig, trying to get schools on board, trying to get clinicians on board, trying to get systems on board to actually understand what the issues are for these children. And certainly I spent a lot of time with a lot of what people would probably term very naughty boys that no one kind of wanted anywhere in the system and certainly not in schools. And so it was, it was, it was a really um, both a good and a bad learning experience in terms of some of the experiences I had working with these systems. And to culminate in finally um, doing the Royal Commission, it was, it was five years of listening to incredibly traumatic stories um, over the five year period and trying to understand what that was like uh, for, for children as they went through our systems of care. This first quote is actually from one of our survivors who, uh, this is his message to Australia. In 1978, a little boy started crying. In 2014, he still is. Uh, and I think that that's, that's a really big take-home message about trauma. And I really thank all of the people that contributed to the work of the Royal Commission, often at great personal cost um, and with great courage and, and bravery in coming forward. Um, because trauma doesn't ever go away. It finds a way to come to the surface. But for children, when they're going through this, it's often very, very difficult for them to articulate what's going on. So we really do need to be alert and aware and understand what is happening for our kids in order to understand their behaviour that's presenting to us. So I'm going to start off with a bit of an introduction as to who I am. Uh, this is my grandmother holding my mum. And this is me with my first child. I'm a bit younger there and a bit slimmer, I think. I want to be able to get to the time when we have the technology, you know, where you have the avatar that does your presentation for you? <laughs> I know what I'm going to look like. <laughs> but anyway, you've got, you've got the real thing today. And just to remind us that, that life, of course, is all, always about relationships. And so as, as my grandmother held my mum, my mum held me and I hold my children. And in a way, that's, that's what it's all about. How do we hold our children in mind? How do we hold our children in schools? How do we hold our children in love? As we help them navigate these systems of life um, and, and education. And of course, we also know that some of the best learning opportunities come from those safe, strong relationships that we have with people. And so teachers and schools play an incredibly important role in that. And I admire everyone who works in education. I think sometimes you get a really tough job. Um, but I admire you for staying the course and providing that opportunity for our kids to thrive. So I called this Thoughtful Schools on, based on Karen's project because I think it, it is, is something that we need to think about. We need to be reflective about what we're doing in education. You have our kids for some 12 or 13 years. Think of the potential for influence over all of that time. It's amazing. There's no other system that really has that much influence. And particularly during periods of very strong development, which is often when we have, when we really sort of take on those experiences in a much stronger way. It's harder to teach us when we're a bit older. So you're getting people through that developmental phases, which are so important. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just the roles of schools in general, the role of teachers. Um, I'm going to reflect back on the findings of the Royal Commission, uh, a little bit of the developmental and clinical issues that we face, and a little bit about the ways forward. Uh, because Howard already covered a lot of stuff around trauma, um, I thought I would take a slightly different approach. So if we look at the role of schools, they are highly valued institutions. Um, your, 
you've got an ever increasing broadening role of what you have to do. I, I've, I've heard teachers say, I'm, I'm not just an educator, I now have to be a social worker and a psychologist and a family worker and you know, it, it becomes really difficult to get onto the core um, teaching that you're meant to do in terms of education. So I understand that schools are under enormous pressure to, to be everything to everybody at all times. But there are roles in health and safety and in teaching protective behaviours and providing safe institutions for our children and promoting wellbeing. You teach social and life skills. There are social and cultural and religious and moral values that are, are also taught within the school system. You're the exact place where you're in prime position to look at early intervention, to understand warning signs, to look at risk and to provide therapeutic environments where children can thrive. Schools are potentially a place of both sanctuary but they can also be a place of harm and we need to be really careful about how we deal with that. And of course we also know that a safe environment um, is an essential prerequisite for effective learning in schools. If we look at the role of the teachers and the school staff, again you're taking on these additional roles, your, your role models, your inspiration sometimes to our kids when you take them on, your advocates, you provide support. Sometimes you become quasi-psychiatrists I think, um, but it, it becomes an ever-expanding role. In some of the Royal Commission research we did when we did um, uh, some uh, stakeholder groups with young people and, and, and you know, children as well, um, that they, they told us that, that after a friend or a parent, um, children and young people would turn to a teacher for help. So, so teachers were a really incredibly important part of that child's safety network or support system. Um, and of course through the life of the Commission we heard many positive reports of the role schools played in identification, in safety and in helping that child recover. Unfortunately there were also some other issues that I will just touch on so that we get a full picture of what happened in schools. So just in terms of the Royal Commission I was involved in, it was the Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse. Um, our terms of reference were to find ways to better protect children, to achieve best practice in the reporting of and responding to child sexual abuse, and to address or alleviate the impact of past, future um, abuse, including justice. Have, were some of you aware of some of the public hearings we did? Uh, we did a lot of public hearings on schools, actually. It was probably you know, one of the largest sections along with out-of-home care. And our three pillars were to do private sessions, so take individual stories and hear personal stories, to do public hearings and to um, be involved in policy and research. Over the course of the five years, we did private sessions with just over 8,000 people. That's a lot of stories. We also received lots of written accounts. We, we referred thousands of matters to the police and we held uh, private sessions in every capital city. We also went to all of the major prisons. One time they said to me, Helen, you're going to Wellington. I thought, oh, a trip to New Zealand? No, Wellington's an hour out of Dubbo. There's a maximum security prison there. A bit of a different experience than what I was expecting. But... And quite honestly, um, what was sort of, I think, a bit uh, hard-hitting for me about some of the prisons was that a lot of the stories suggested to me if we'd actually just looked after some of those men as boys, like they just probably wouldn't have been there. And uh, that's the sad part of trauma and its impact. So it was a very, very extensive inquiry. So these were the institutional types that were complained about. And in yellow, you can see schools. Over two and a half thousand people talked about schools as their source of harm, their place of harm. It was quite a large proportion of the stories overall. So we need to make sure that we don't repeat things from the past, that our schools are the safest they can be. And so I want to make three pictures for trauma-informed care. One is that if it's not trauma-informed, then how do you know we're not making these mistakes from the past, we're not making a safe place for children? The second is a lot of your staff that come and work in your schools may well have trauma histories. How do you know your systems of supporting those staff are good enough if you don't come from a trauma-informed system approach? And then, of course, the third and the, and the most important reason is that we want to make sure that those children who are traumatised coming into your system of care get the best possible outcomes that we can achieve. So in terms of the schools, there were over a thousand different schools complained about. 55% um, of them were non-government. 
30% of the survivors told us they were actually abused by a teacher. And one of the increasing problems in the more contemporary setting for schools was that 14%, which were more of the contemporary cases, told us they were abused at school by another child. And I think this is another issue that we grapple with in the present day, is how do we deal with children who have harmful sexual behaviours within schools? And I think this is a really difficult dilemma that we all have to try and solve together if we're going to get the best outcomes. And in fact, there's a whole chapter devoted to that in the Royal Commission report, if you want to have a look at it. Um, it's 18 volumes, the final report. Don't read it all. I had to. Don't expect any. In fact, I know one other person, I think, who was not related to the Royal Commission who actually read it, which I thought was an amazing thing. Um, but there's some very, very good information in it. So if we look at the impacts of what happens to children when they've come from these adverse experiences, and certainly um, Howe has already outlined some of that, the impacts are complex and they're interconnected. We don't know how an individual child is going to respond to the trauma that they experience. Sexual abuse affects many areas of a person's life, but the, the way the institution responds to that person can either add or subtract to the trauma. So you can either make it better for the child or you can make it much worse. And in fact, for some people, they told us that the institutional response was almost as bad for them as what actually happened in childhood. So it's really important. Uh, it also has ripple effects. And I know for our Aboriginal community in particular, that intergenerational impact has been significant. If you take one institution where, or a mission in WA where you take a, the story of a, a woman who may have been taken away as part of stolen generation and put in that, insta, in that mission, her mother and grandmother may have been in the same mission and her daughter and grandchild may have been already in contemporary out-of-home care. You can have five generations of trauma on one story. So I don't think we've grappled quite with the real impact of that on families down the generations either. But it will play out in schools. Uh, uh, impacts are also very complex and profound. Um, they're difficult to isolate one impact from another. They differ by in individuals. They also change over time with development. Things aren't, aren't static. They, they change over time. I didn't put slides in on the neurobiological impacts because um, some of that was covered by Howard. But if we look at the impact on the developing brain, we know it can affect all spheres of development. And in fact, there, there has now been enough evidence to show there are significant changes to both brain structure and function from sustained trauma in childhood. So it's not that the kids are misbehaving. Some of this is actually permanent change to their brain function and structure that we have to try somehow and reverse through uh, various means. And of course, um, impacts are also influenced by many other factors outside of the child and the abuse. In particular, from the private sessions from survivors, almost everybody universally identified impacts on mental health. Lots of people described impacts on interpersonal relationships. But look at the next one. Lots of people described impacts on education. Now, the biggest, the, probably the most common story that, that I heard over the course of the five years, and this is also repeated from the clinical work I've done over many years, is that kids often told, people, adults telling their story as a child often told me that when things started to happen, their, their, their achievement at school fell off. It went down. And they started having problems at school. Now, that was either missed or it was put down to something else. Or if they were asked about what was happening, the child didn't feel safe enough to disclose. So it went unnoticed or it went unresolved. Um, and so the education didn't improve, and they couldn't learn. And of course, once you fall out of schools, particularly in that teenage years, very, very hard to get back. And then, of course, you get the, um, the cascade of impacts into drug and alcohol abuse or criminality. Um, some people said they didn't come back to education until they were in their 30s or 40s. How much harder is it to do it then? So there's this real issue about trauma and learning that we've got to try and get better at. Because for so many of these people, one of their griefs or one of their losses in their life was that they never achieved their full potential. Some of these kids were really bright. Who knows what they could have achieved had these things not happened or had we been able to help them in their journey of recovery. And of course, lots of people spoke about issues around um, uh, difficulties with the, the relationships, the inability to feel a sense of love and peace and joy. The other thing that people also described to me was that when the abuse started happening, it was almost like they were surrounded by a force field. 
They felt unable to reach out. And they felt unable to let anyone reach in. And that sense of profound isolation often stayed with them for a very, very long time. And as they got older, the only place they felt safe was on their own. And of course that's not good for mental health, is it? We are relational beings. We get a lot of satisfaction out of our relationships. But for kids who have these sorts of traumas, isolation is sometimes the only time they feel protected. So what's the role of schools in trauma? Well, school should be a safe haven. It should be a sanctuary. You should be able to identify and respond to the behaviour or to a risk or to a disclosure. What we found from a lot of the kids' stories and from the, some of the um, conversations we had with young people is they often said at school they tested the water. So they told a little bit and they tested the response. If the response was indifferent or not very good, they weren't going to go any further. But if it was good, then they may actually tell you the real story. So you have a very, very unique opportunity here to provide that safe environment for children to be able to tell you to test the water and then to be able to take that next step. We know that trauma impacts significantly on learning. We also know that there's a difference between what is trauma-informed care, which is an approach, a systemic approach to making sure we don't re-traumatise people and we give them a safe journey, and trauma competency. I would argue we need both. Does our current school system, and this is a genuine question from me because I haven't worked with schools in recent years, how good are we in our school system of knowing how to educate a traumatised brain? Do, do we? Are we there yet? I, I don't think so. So we really have to work on this together because we know that if a child starts heading downwards in achievement in education, doesn't finish year 12 very well, that's kind of going to predict their life outcome. We've got to get them back up to the level of true potential. And of course schools can have a huge uh, role in recovery um, and play their part in that. So a little bit about trauma and development. It can be difficult to identify. It's not always understood and behaviours can change over time. Um, children's behaviour is always more problematic if the trauma goes on and on and on and becomes chronic. Manifestations can be very non-specific. Basically the take home message here, if you don't think about trauma, you'll miss it. If you think that you know, behave, what drives behaviour is because there's a family issue or it's because there's this or it's because of puberty or you know, raging hormones or whatever it is that you want to put it down to, if you don't think about trauma, you will not see it. Diagnostic criteria in the children, particularly young kids, is really problematic. Screening instruments are pretty inadequate and not very helpful. The child behaviour checklist, for example, which a lot of um, child developmental specialists use, doesn't pick up trauma. In, it's probably going to overdiagnose ADHD, and I'll get to that in a minute. It's one of my bugbears. And there's the influence of age, cultural issues. I think we mislabel our Aboriginal boys very badly a lot of times in schools because we don't understand some of their cultural behaviours either. And there are lots of other de developmental issues that come into play. We also know that in terms of disclosure, um, it's often over time that it develops. So they'll tell a little bit, a little bit more, they'll retract it, it'll come back again. But it's never an easy story for someone to be able to tell. And for some children, they don't even know what it is they're experiencing. They don't have the words or the language or the emotions to even describe what's going on. Um, I think you referred to Rage Howard at some point. Um, what we found from a lot of the stories from the men was that they didn't really know how to respond emotionally when things were happening. But the rage hit them at about 15, 16, 17. And it just came up. And it just either came out in the form of violence or it went internal in the form of self-harm, drug use, depression, mental illness. So these things are really important to understand. Um, and we also found from the research that the most reliable uh, way of understanding trauma is a child self-report. So trauma can take on multiple different behaviours. Almost any diagnosis is possible. 
Maltreatment can also cause both inappropriate and exceptional social behaviours and responses, and it does impact on all spheres of development, and it's worse for younger children, and it has a cumulative effect over time. It can affect memory systems, it affects all your neurobiological systems, it affects your opioid system, that's the part of the numbing response that people get, it affects your adrenaline and your cortisol, all of those systems of self-regulation can be impacted. Some of the common responses, um, uh, Howard's already gone through this, but um, I'll, I just want to make a couple of particular uh, points here. Hypervigilance can be hyperactivity. Startle response can be that uh, um, restlessness. Preoccupation with the behaviour of others can be distractibility. What does it sound like? ADHD. I don't know how many times I got kids referred to me in clinic multiple medications, multiple diagnoses. In fact, they had all the three-letter acronyms, ODD, ADD, OCD, a few more maybe. Julian, you've, you probably remember all of those. Um, in actual fact, no one had taken a proper history. No one had understood the trauma and the impact that the child had, had the, the impact the trauma had, had on the child's development. And if you relabeled hyperactivity as hypervigilance, and the irritability as the startle response, and the, pre, uh, the distractibility as the preoccupation with the behaviour of others, suddenly you've got a completely different diagnosis. I don't really know that we can treat trauma with dexamphetamine. I think that's a problem. And of course, when kids are constantly anticipating threat and scanning for danger, um, and you're a boy, and you're in the playground, and someone comes up behind you and taps you on the shoulder, what do you think is going to happen? They're going to turn around and punch you in the face. So I think we need to be able to see what drives behaviour and not what the behaviour actually is. And of course, one of the big issues for trauma for children is it impairs mastery. So children grow up with a sense of not feeling good at anything, not being able to develop a sense of personal agency and being able to control their reactions. The other responses are things like post-traumatic play, reenactment of events. You can get the classic PTSD type phenomena like dissociation, self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm, I'm bad, bad things are going to happen, and then bad things do happen, and so you get this reinforcement of a negative perception. One of the things that people may not be so aware of is the anticipatory anxiety that something bad will happen can be so overwhelming. The child will drive you to respond. And they do. They want you to react and yell at them and throw them out the classroom because then they relax. That's when the anxiety goes down once the response has happened and then they feel calm. So what do we do? We, we exactly respond like that. So it's totally reinforcing that impaired system that they have. And of course, thrill-seeking and self-medicating and deliberate self-harm um, is also part of the picture. And you can get victimisation both ways. So kids who have been victimised are more likely to become more, more victimised later on. So bullying can be a, a big thing for, for children who already have a history of trauma. But children who have been traumatised may also victimise others. So we have to be aware that some of those bullies or some of those kids who are being aggressive may actually have significant history of trauma. So part of our recommendations for all institutions was about um, implementing the child safe standards. I'm sure some of you are probably aware of some of that. Um, uh, there's been, we now have the Office of Child Safety and they have a, a slightly different version, but it's essentially the same sort of 10 principles. We also thought that there needed to be really um, uh, a better regulation and oversight in schools, improving the way complaints and disclosures about child sexual abuse are handled, and providing workers with skills and knowledge to keep children safe. All, all fairly straightforward. Um, part of the other uh, findings of the Royal Commission was that we found that the service system um, uh, it was limited by a lack of knowledge. There was an unavailability of expertise to, to assist children, particularly in schools. Um, how well does your school system interact with the child mental health system, for example? Good? Bad? Indifferent? Not working? Sorry? Services are really unavailable. Unavailable. Yeah. So we, we need to change this. We, we just can't have these silos. 
If this is all about the well-being of all of our children, for goodness sake, look how many of you are here tonight. Let's all get together and work on this together. There is um, uh, ad hoc availability of expertise. And look, let's be real here. In the rural and remote communities, I heard there were people here from Fitzroy Crossing and Horse Creek. What expertise have you got available in your areas? I would think pretty, pretty limited. In fact, I know the child and adolescent mental health system is pretty poor up there, and certainly the availability of a developmental and allied health specialists is even, even poorer. So how do we mount a proper response when we've got such a lack of availability of specialist resources? Um, and there's limited collaboration between service systems. It's a very broken, fragmented service system. And yet we know that a good service system that's responsive can actually do marvellous things. So we need to be able to understand how child sexual abuse can affect people and shape their support needs. We need to have a cohesive system approach and we need to be able to support staff to work safely, efficiently and effectively. We also need to ensure that all of our services are trauma-informed, collaborative, available, accessible, all of those sorts of things that we want and that we also have good healing approaches from an Aboriginal perspective as well. Probably run out of time, have I? Okay. Started getting onto tangents. Or so. so I think that some of the focus areas in terms of um, working in the best interests of the children is that we've got to create child safe communities where all of our service systems work together. We've got to establish the child safe standards and we've got to have good oversight. So these are some of the issues that I think we need to think about. In terms of education and, tra and training, are our training institutions adequate? Do we adequately prepare our teachers to go into schools where there's a lot of traumatised kids and know how to handle all of the issues that you're going to face in the school system? I suspect not. Um, in the way that we train our teachers, is that safe for the training? Do we teach a trauma-informed, trauma-competent curriculum as required? Are we proactive in preventing and managing for our staff who are on the front line and dealing with these issues every day? Do we help them with their compassion fatigue? Do we help them with their vicarious traumatisation? I can imagine that for some schools with very high levels of need, with, with a lot of traumatised kids, you must be absolutely burnt out. I know our mental health systems are burnt out. And we're dealing with a similar population group. So we've got to get better at having a really responsive service system, uh, sorry, a, a responsive staff support system as well, if we're going to get better at managing trauma-informed care. Do we start at the right point? Do we have an atmosphere in our schools that one of dignity and respect? Would you, if you were a child or a young person, would you feel comfortable in your education system approaching someone about a traumatic story. I don't think we quite provide that level of sanctuary or safety or confidentiality or support where we can enable children to be able to come forward if they need to. And how do we reduce that re-traumatisation and the triggers that are going to be inherent across our systems? Do we know how to bear witness? Are any of you taught what to do if a child discloses to you something traumatic? Some? Yeah? Yep. So we've got somewhere. But I think we could also probably improve our response to that as well. Because what we know is if you close down a disclosure, you may not get another opportunity. That child might not have another opportunity for 10 or 20 years. In fact, the average delay in disclosure we found in the Royal Commission, people didn't, didn't disclose their trauma for an average of over 20 years. So what are we doing wrong that we're not providing people with that opportunity? And we need to make sure we have safe journeys for children. Trauma disrupts the personal narrative and it has the potential to impact lifelong. It's really difficult for children to seek help. And what children told us is that they can be told what to do and they need very concrete messages about what to do. But they said, but we want parents to notice. We want adults around us to notice. We want adults to say, what's going on? What's wrong here? Or do you need help? So we've got to make the journey for all of our children through our systems and services safe and collaborative. We've got to have a much better connection between schools, our mental health systems, our child protection systems and juvenile justice. We have probably all share the same families, but how often do we really talk about it together? And we've also got to get beyond some of the trauma-informed to trauma competency. 
I would say that we probably do need some specialisation in education around what works best for some of the really traumatised kids in terms of how they learn, what the models of teaching and learning should be. Certainly in mental health, that's what we have to do. We have to have an additional level of expertise and training for some of those really complex trauma cases. Um, getting kids back on track with education is absolutely vital, not just for recovery, but for their life outcomes. You can make a huge difference if you can get that child learning again. So, we need to create the right story for our kids, a good story, a positive story, within really strong relationships throughout whatever service system they may be in, whether it's education or whatever. We have to understand the context of their lives. We have to apply a cultural lens, particularly for our Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander kids, but also for our refugee kids. We have to have a responsive service system that's trauma-informed and competent that's collaborative and it's got to be within a compassionate society so that we can tell the really good story rather than the stories I've been hearing for the last 30 years that once upon a time our children absolutely thrived and, and achieved the potential of, of brilliance which I think they all have the potential to do. And I'll leave you with one final comment. This was um, uh, a lecture I went to many years ago and the fellow at that lecture said, every child deserves to have someone crazy about them, not crazy at them. Thanks.